Hey, how you doing? Uh, so you might not know this, but I just returned from two months of paternity leave. I'm now a dad, would you believe it? Um, and I knew I was gonna have a lot of downtime because there's this thing that babies really love to do for like 16 hours a day. It's called sleeping. The question then was what games were going to take up my time during that period. I was planning to catch up with a bunch of games, but I also wanted one I could burn a hundred hours or more on over the course of a few weeks. In the end, I decided on Bloodborne because A, it was a PS4 game, so I knew I'd be comfortable playing it on my couch, and B, because you people won't stop asking us to do a documentary on From Software. So if I was going to spend some time away from editing, at the very least, I could do some research. I played Bloodborne when I worked at GameSpot. The whole editorial team at the time kind of did. That's what we did. We kind of moved from game to game. And without the, I don't know, skill or inclination to really keep at it, uh, I bounced off pretty quickly. I played it for a couple of weeks and then, you know, went on to whatever the next new big game was. I knew that I hadn't given it its fair shake. So staring down the barrel of a hundred or so hours of sitting on my couch with my newborn asleep on my chest, I started up Bloodborne again. I picked a lady named her after my baby girl and the two of us went wandering into the Yarnum night. And let me tell you now, I had no idea what was coming. Alright, first some cliff notes for the uninitiated. Bloodborne is made by From Software, a prolific Japanese developer previously most known for their Armored Core series. They've since been enjoying a renaissance of late after they basically invented a new genre of game with Demon Souls and then evolved it into Dark Souls. Bloodborne is one of the latest games in that lineage. It's a game with sprawling interconnected levels that loop back on each other, which contain enemies of various difficulty boasting unique and challenging attack patterns. You can travel between lampposts that act as checkpoints, fast travel markers, and a way of ejecting yourself out of the world into a hub area known as the Hunter's Dream. This hub world allows you to level up and buy stuff using the blood echoes you've collected by killing enemies. If you die in the world, you drop all of your echoes. So you spend most of your time collecting as many of these echoes as possible and rushing to a lamppost to effectively bank them before getting killed. Sometimes that's running back to a previous lamp, sometimes it's venturing forward into the unknown to find the next one. So much of the challenge of this game comes from the fact that the lamps are generally pretty far apart from each other. And critically, at least on your first playthrough, you have no idea where they are. Essentially, it's a game where you're running around terrified, searching for lamps. Why are you scared? Because the enemies in this world can kill you in a single hit. The flip side to this challenge is that enemy placement is predetermined. So while your first run through the game can feel like wandering through a dark cave looking for an exit, subsequent playthroughs are much less intimidating as you develop the knowledge of where everything is. This is one of the most important aspects of the design of Bloodborne. Areas that were previously terrifying become familiar. So the player develops a pattern of environmental mastery simply by exploring these worlds. You learn to love every fine detail in this world, the corners enemies hide behind, the placement of items, the various shortcuts between areas. So where once you were hopelessly wandering through unfamiliar streets waiting for the next thing to jump out at you, after a few hours you're basically Neo. Anticipating every single enemy and how they're likely to attack, killing things to the beat of your drum, farming familiar areas to collect blood echoes that will fortify you for the journey ahead. I found this type of world design especially wonderful as it flies in the face of so much of what modern action games are doing. I could talk to you all day about every little nook and cranny of this world, but if you were to ask me, say, where the location of the DedSec headquarters is in Watch Dogs 2, a game that I played a lot of and really enjoyed, I honestly couldn't remember. Worlds like that are gorgeously made, I think Watch Dogs 2 is a perfect example of this, but the problem is scale. The scale of these worlds have made them impossible to get to know in any sort of intimate detail. But I do know the streets of Old Yarnum. I know them like I know the streets of my hometown. The corners, the sight lines, the detail. The other misconception I had about this game is that it was some sort of hack and slash affair. I've always had an affinity for the precision of shooters, and so I've generally not been as interested in third-person action games where the combat is based around flurries of combinations and generally feels less precise to me. Basically, I have no time for games like Dynasty Warriors or Devil May Cry. They're just not for me. However, Bloodborne's combat couldn't be further from those games. But of course, I didn't realize that coming in. So the first time I beat Bloodborne's first boss, the Cleric Beast, 
fast, I noticed I had almost run out of blood vials, the health stim packs of this world. That means I used around 18 of these in the fight. I now know that's not normal, at the risk of sounding like a jerk, that's kind of not how you're supposed to play this game. I was playing this game the way I thought I was meant to, by attacking when I could and occasionally dodging. Which I guess is actually the way most people probably think that they're meant to play it, but just like how the same street in Bloodborne feels very different the first time you walk down it than, say, the 100th time, the combat in this game is also about that type of familiarity and mastery. It's very hard to win by button mashing because there's no animation cancelling in Bloodborne. That means that unlike most video games, if you hit the attack button, your hunter is going to attack. You can't just mash the jump button to cancel it. And you better hit your enemy before they hit you, because one mistimed strike might leave you open, and one of theirs might just kill you in one hit. But once you have repeated encounters with these enemies, you start to understand the way they move, when they're open, when to strike, and crucially, when not to. There's nothing imprecise about Bloodborne's combat. When you're killed in this game, it's because you haven't figured out how to defeat that enemy yet, or you just got sloppy. And on the flip side, once you actually defeat something, it feels like you climbed Mount Everest. There's this optional enemy in the game called the Blood Starved Beast. It took me maybe 30 attempts to beat it the first time and I had to call in an AI to help me do it. But on my second run through, I beat it solo with a mana build on my first attempt because now I knew how it moved. I knew that little stammer it did just before its swiping attack meant that I should roll to its right. I knew to circle it around the pillars. I knew that if I threw some pungent blood cocktails, I could distract it and attack it from the rear. And when I finally killed it on that first attempt, thinking it was going to take me hours and hours again, I screamed so loud, I woke my poor little girl. But here's the reason I really, really love this game. It's because Bloodborne doesn't care that I've played a million games before it. It doesn't even care what I think things should be called. Pungent blood cocktails, cleric beasts, blood vials, vile bloods. One of the most enjoyable parts of playing this game is coming to grips with the idiosyncratic terminology of this world. Nothing in the game is named normally and most of the items you pick up have baffling uses that you either have to randomly use to find out or search wikis to figure out what they do. Oh look, you've picked up some frenzied cold blood. Oh look, you've now gathered some shining coins. Oh great, this crow dropped a pebble. Oh, so you want to increase your bullet damage. Oh, then of course you're just going to have to rub some bone marrow ash on them. Oh, I see you've picked up some madman's knowledge. Consume that to gain insight, but don't have too much insight, because then the crosses on the mannequin guides outside the cathedral will change color, and you'll frenzy the second you see a winter lantern. This idiosyncrasy extends out to any assumptions you might have about the mechanics of the game too. For instance, guns aren't really guns in this game. You don't shoot things to hurt them. It's effectively a shield and used to stagger enemies so you can repost them with your main weapon. But of course you don't know that the first few times you fruitlessly unload on some torch-bearing Yarnamite. And all of this stuff, the world exploration, the particulars of the combat, the bizarre bibliography, it all contributes to this feeling. And it's a feeling that every single one of us as game players has had, but it's one that I haven't had since I was a child. So to explain this, we're gonna have to go back for a second. The Secret of Monkey Island is the first game that I ever completed back on my Amiga 600. These are actually the original copies of the game that I owned. They are super illegal. Sorry, Tim Schafer. It took me three months to eventually get Guybrush from talking to the lookout to enjoying some fireworks with Elaine. But in those three months, I learned what it was to play a point and click game. I learned how they worked. In fact, I learned a lot about how game stories and objectives work. Similarly, the first FPS I ever completed was Half-Life. It took me two months. I still remember replaying areas over and over again, trying to learn how the AI of the grunts worked. I did this because it was new and exciting. I'd never fought enemies like this before, because I'd never really played an FPS before. And after my first run through on easy, that one that took two months, I started it again on hard, and completed it in under a week. There are plenty of wonderful videos about how Bloodborne and the Soul series are some of the best games ever designed. But I think the reason these games are so memorable, at least to me, is because they tap into something deeper. The feeling of not knowing how a game works. Bloodborne is now one of my favorite games ever. Part of that is because it's just a tremendously well-designed game. But another reason is that for the first time in too long, 
I didn't know the rules. I had to learn how this game worked, not via a tutorial or using 20 years of game playing knowledge, but simply by being bad at it, by playing and by figuring out the rules for myself. Here's the thing, these games aren't difficult games. They're not hard games. You just start playing being bad at them. And that's something we're not really used to. That's why so many people fall off these games because we're so used to being mollycoddled by either the design of the game or propped up by decades of knowledge of how to play games. But the reason we love games is because of that feeling of exploration we first experience. That same love of games you nurtured through time and pressure and getting better and beating your favorite game. Well, Bloodborne allowed me and Old Blood to experience that for the first time in years. So when people on the internet tell you that Dark Souls and Bloodborne are hardcore, they're wrong. They're not difficult. They're just games that you're not any good at yet. And just like when you were a kid, go-karting or pointing and clicking or aiming down sights, there are games out there today, right now, that can give you that childlike sense of wonder again. You just have to go hunting for them. Thanks so much for watching Bonus Level and to all the people who have contributed to our Patreon in the past uh, couple of days. It's been incredible. We've already uh, broken through to our first goal and we're well on our way to getting our second one, Embedded Documentaries. Uh, two things to talk about. First of all, yes, I have played Dark Souls since. I am absolutely loving it and I'm planning on playing uh, Dark Souls 2 and 3 as well once I've gotten through the first game. Uh, and second of all, From Software... Yes, we'd love to do a documentary on them, um, but right now they're not interested. I reached out to them. They were super kind and super communicative. Um, they love the work we do, but it's just not part of their, I guess, studio culture to do the sort of doors open. Let's talk to everyone about the particulars of their design. Um, I think they like the mystery, and I... I can't really blame them for it at all. Um, maybe there's a way we can do some sort of documentary about the game, maybe how it's influenced other designers, stuff like that. Uh, we're actually working on a project that I'm going to be filming next week that does that for a different game. So maybe we'll use that as a test bed and see if we can come back to that for Bloodborne. Um, you're going to have to wait and find out what that game is, though. Or I could just tell you.